The year is 1856, and the Crimean War is in full swing along the southern axis of the Russian Empire. A war that was sparked due to a dispute over the protection of Christians in the fading Ottoman realm quickly turned into one of diplomatic posturing. The mainly British and French forces being sent to quell Russian desires at absorbing Ottoman territories and potentially establishing a protectorate. Yet it was the devastation caused by the short yet decisive conflict that propelled reform within the government of the new Tsar, Alexander II. How could it be that the Russian military performed so poorly against adversaries that were based thousands of miles away? How was it that the British and the French had no difficulty projecting their military power onto the land of another supposed great power, yet that great power could not reciprocate even on its own soil? Hastily, the Tsar sued for peace in which the empire's prestige was heavily scarred. Here, although the British and French models of recruitment focused on smaller professional standing armies, they still maintained a technological advantage that was able to amplify their punching power. This was especially the case with rifles. In actuality, a small portion of the Russian army served during the war, with much of the army being dispersed to the peripheries of the vast empire. Many troops were kept in anticipation of an Anglo-Swedish invasion in the Baltic region, and plenty more were kept in the Caucasus battling the North Caucasian cohorts of the famed Imam Shamil. This would evidently lead to catastrophe as a smaller Anglo-French army was able to inflict defeats upon the Russians through a method similar to defeat in detail, which meant to defeat an enemy by destroying small portions of its armies instead of engaging its entire strength. However, this wasn't a fully intentional strategy, rather it signaled a fundamental flaw in Russian troop placements. The lack of reserves. Let us backtrack a bit, as in the other side of the European continent, a different story was emerging. Universal male conscription as we know it didn't come around until the aftermath of the French Revolution in 1798, in which the concept of the citizen soldier first arose. Until then, wars were just seen as dynastic struggles which were in part alien to your average citizen. What conscription did was to tie the interests of the state with that of its citizens, and no better state exemplified this than Prussia. The concept of conscription in Prussia didn't take into fruition until the disastrous defeat at the hands of Napoleon in the Battle of Jena, in which the army was permanently reduced to 19% of its previous strength. To fix this, General Gerhard Johann von Scharnhorst proposed a system called the Krumper system in which older, more experienced soldiers would be placed on leave with newer recruits taking their place. This allowed the Prussians to maintain the image of a small standing army whilst maintaining a larger reserve force. Fast forward to November the 9th, 1867, and a law has been passed thus implementing the ideas of Albrecht von Roon. Conscription was further increased with new military schools for non-commissioned officers and officers. Most of the logistics and support troops of the Prussian army would be land via military units. By now, conscription started at the age of 20, in which a young man would complete three years of active service, after which they would be placed in the reserve pool for a further four years. A further five years were finally dedicated to the land via, which kind of worked like the US National Guard does today. The results. A moderately sized army with a vast manpower pool, what I deem to be a shadow army. Although according to Field Marshal Helmut von Molke, the Russians made some of the most obedient soldiers in the world. But the Russian Empire endured borderline humiliation in the Crimean debacle. It needed a system that could mobilize enough reserves in order to cover its vast territories. With curiosity, it looked to the Prussian system. Yet it was not until the Franco-Prussian War that the Prussian reservist system made a sound impression. You see, the French army up until this point had drifted back to the professional standing army, whilst the Prussians favored the reservist system and with such military philosophies at odds, a decisive clash was bound to happen the Battle of Sedan. An army of 124,000 professional French soldiers surrendered to the armies of German militiamen and reservists, which to simply put it, outnumbered the French. For example, 
At the start of the war, in August 1870, the French army numbered 241,827 soldiers, whereas the German armies numbered over 459,700 soldiers. With the victory of the reserve system apparent, except in the United States, Russia was ready and in 1874 enacted the Universal Military Training Act, which introduced universal male conscription, thus including the nobility, who since 1762 were not obliged to serve in the military. This clearly followed the long Napoleonic and Prussian traditions, but here, soldiers at the age of 21 served for an initial six years, followed by an additional nine years in the reserves. So there were 12-year obligations in the Prussian army versus 15-year obligations in the Russian army, even though reductions of service and exemptions existed in both armies, mainly based on education. It should however be noted that the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation has put that by the beginning of the 20th century, military obligations were scaled from 3 years to 5 years, depending on units. Thus, the tradition of the reserve was born in the Russian Empire, which allowed it to engage in a prolonged conflict with the German Empire during the First World War. Think about it for a moment. Most major wars in the latter part of the 19th century didn't even last over a year. Say country A has a standing army of 200,000, and country B has a standing army of 100,000. It would seem fair to say that country A has a numerical advantage, right? But let's say that country B employs a reservist system, unlike country A. Thus it has a further 500,000 soldiers that it could conscript without needing to train. On the other hand, country A would need to train 300,000 fresh soldiers in order to reach parity, and this would be costly in time and resources. Thus before country A would have time to generate new forces, country B could come in with a decisive blow, hence a big reason why wars were so short. Such was the case that the British Empire even had difficulty maintaining its volunteer army in the start of the First World War, and thus had to enact a Military Service Act in 1916. Abstract manpower pools based on total national population were now irrelevant compared to the sustainability of reserves. Jumping to the aftermath of World War I, we can see that conscription in Germany was cut short from the Treaty of Versailles and only reintroduced in 1935. Thus the Germans weren't able to build their shadow army for over 15 years, whereas the energy from the Universal Military Training Act of 1874 still ran deep through the veins of the Soviet Union, albeit in a different form. For example, within a month of the start of Operation Barbarossa in 1941, the Soviet Stavka authorized the mobilization of over 800,000 reservists, even though most of these units did not reach the front line in time. As a result, Forward Soviet units along the German-Soviet border were outnumbered and decimated by the Wehrmacht and its allies. In this context, the reserve system instituted 67 years ago played a direct role in allowing the force generation of 40 armies from July to December 1941. Over 12 million Soviet citizens could be mobilized from the onset of the Great Patriotic War thus allowing for garrisons in the peripheries like in the North Caucasus and the Manchurian border. Even then, because of the sheer size of the Soviet Union and the lessons of the Crimean War, only around half of the active army was at the front at any given time. This is backed up by the 1941 Far East Order of Battle, in which some 682,000 Soviet soldiers faced off the Japanese Kwangtun Army Group on the Manchurian border, which had six field armies. The Germans would obviously face similar problems at guarding their peripheries, such as the Atlantic Wall and the Balkans, but the European continent was much smaller than the Soviet Union and had access to better infrastructure. Thus, strategic redeployments were more feasible. For the Soviets, their peripheral units would just seem stuck. By late 1942, the Soviets were able to have 64% of their forces at the front, up from 49% in the spring, showing the innovation of the reserve system. Yet for the Germans, the situation was bleak. I was able to estimate the German army strength of 1942 to 1943 by using permanent loss percentages of total army strength. 
Thus, the Germans had 6.9 million soldiers, of whom roughly 36% were on the Eastern Front. Yet very few German soldiers remained in other occupied territories, like in France. During that same time period, German Allied troop contributions varied between half a million to a million soldiers. Thus, if we counted those Allied units as a quasi-reservist bunch, then it would be as if 43-50% to 50 of the German forces were in the Eastern Front. Still short of the Soviet frontline concentrations, but nonetheless important in supplementing a lack of German reserves. As opposed to the assistance of Germany's allies, the Western allies could not simply send 600,000 soldiers to Manchuria. And imagine the trouble caused when the Soviets would occupy foreign territory. Even more reserves would be needed. Although it is true that the Soviets successfully employed liberation armies for the Poles, Romanians, Bulgarians, and Czechs toward 1945. The point of this video is not really to showcase the reserve usage of the Germans and Soviets, as that would be too complex and abstract, and I'm sure I've gotten a few things wrong on the German side. However, it is to demonstrate that implementing the tradition of universal conscription in 1874 unleashed a critical juncture that directly impacted the Soviet chance of victory during the Great Patriotic War. Part of the lack of German reserves was due to the Wehrmacht occupying most of Europe, yet the Soviets had similar constraints and were fighting a defensive war on their own soil. Thus, by surviving the onslaught of the German invasion in 1941, the Soviet Union was able to avoid the brevity of the wars of the 19th century, thus allowing for the complete exploitation of its own industrial and military capabilities. It is thus no surprise that Russia still maintains conscription, thus allowing it to follow a similar strategy of guarding its peripheries whilst maintaining a large standing army. It's still the largest country in the world after all. And by learning from the disaster of guarding distant lands in one war, the Russian Empire inevitably gave a helping hand by ensuring that there were more than enough soldiers to do so in the next war.